Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this last of our series of Max Forums in the COVID winter. Um, today, I am only able to be here virtually, so I wanted to welcome you and thank our funders, uh, the Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation, and an anonymous grantee that made this series possible, who is out there today, I think. Um, and I, uh, it's because of the tenacity and commitment of the MAC staff that we have been able to present work virtually through the pandemic. And um, we have been able to continue to create work with a wonderful cohort of artists that we will be able to present live at the Neuroverse, our second biennial festival that will be in New York, November 4th to the 7th. So you will see the work that you will see referred to today and all the other work we've been doing at this, this crossroads of art and science. And this year, our focus is intelligences, both by official, biologic and artificial. So join us at the Neuroverse live, or we will be offering the appropriate pieces virtually. So please put it on your calendar, November 4th through 7th. So um, because of the wonderfully rich material and minds that we deal with, um, that has attracted a really extraordinary group of people to the Max staff. And I wanna thank some of them today for their contribution to this series and making it happen. Miriam Safrand, who has done all the, the behind the scenes, behind the curtain work so flawlessly throughout the series. Thank you, Miriam. Emily Riley, who has um, juggled the very dense matrix, matrices of ideas and people um, in this forum. Uh, thank you, Emily, and always with a good spirit. And to Augustus Cook, who's made, a pot, it made it so that you would know about this and has made it, made you be, be able to understand what it is we'll be talking about. Um, so thank them all for making this possible. And um, today uh, we do work, we, we, we create work that is, um, harnesses and interrogates the technology. And certainly one of the major technologies of our time is artificial intelligence. So we're looking at that at the festival and we're looking at it today with, um, and Dr. Carl Schoenover will be moderating. He embodies the mission of Max. He is a neuroscientist with the awareness and I would say openness of an artist. Um, so I thank him for doing this and he will be drawing you into the work of Max Machina artist, Philip Schmidt and his piece, How Does Thinking Look Like? And together with Nyla Murray, Dr. Nyla Murray, they will traverse the mind of the engineer. So I look very forward to this conversation. And without further ado, I hand it over to Carl. And in the style only we can actually reach in Zoom, I will now disappear and I will join you by listening in real time, but my service does not allow me to be in video. So enjoy the afternoon and uh, and I look forward to your questions. Hello, everyone. First of all, um, I would like to thank Kay Matzlot and the team and Max for organizing this gathering. Um, thanks especially to Nyland Murray and to Philip Schmidt uh, for kindly agreeing to share their thoughts with us this afternoon. And thanks also to you, all of you out in the ether for joining us on what promises to be a very interesting conversation between Nyla and Philip. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function in the Zoom session. On my window, at least, it's the button uh, that's located on the bottom right of my screen. Um, you can pose your questions throughout, uh, and you'll, you will also have a bit of reserved time at the end uh, to open up the conversation to everyone. My name is Carl Schoonover, and I am a biologist at Columbia University, where I study very basic aspects of animal intelligence. And my work frequently brings me into contact with people like Nyla and Philip, who are both interested in artificial intelligence, uh, although both of them are coming from two very different perspectives uh, and trainings. So to give you a little bit of a sense of what those two perspectives are, uh, I will let them introduce themselves uh, with a few slides um, beginning with Nyla. Thank you so much, Carl, for, uh, for starting us off on this discussion. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd also like to extend my thanks to Kay and all the rest of the organizers, as well as Carl and Philip, for 
for being a part of this conversation and for the invitation to be here. So just to introduce myself a little bit. So I am a research scientist and engineer in the field of artificial intelligence. And my main research focus has always been on extracting meaning from visual signals, be they images or videos. So this is an area of artificial intelligence called computer vision. My earlier work during my, my doctoral studies focused on using insights from psychological, psychophysical and neuroscientific research as a high level inspiration for designing data-driven models of subjective perceptual phenomena. So things like understanding visual attention and aesthetic preference. More recently, my research has turned to the problem of compactly representing visual signals themselves. That is removing as much redundant content as possible from an image and reducing it to the information it contains. Now, when thinking about images, there's one sense in which they can be thought of as largely two dimensional, right? As in the two dimensions you see here in this picture. In another sense though, when we think about every pixel in an image as a dimension or a unit of variation, images are actually extremely high dimensional. So here you can see that we have many dimensions actually in this image. And as all of you know, these are not really the size of pixels. There are many more pixels here than I'm showing. And if you, if you sort of like can think of squeezing a pixel into even, even smaller spaces, then you can think of an image as being actually sort of infinite dimensional. So what that means actually is that uh, when we're working to represent images, we as computer vision researchers and artificial intelligence researchers have to think of the space of all possible images, which is actually infinite because there are like an infinite number of ways that a pixel um, if we think of a pixel as continuous can, can be. So in order to approach this monumental task of how can we really consider and represent the space of all possible images, what we try to do is to identify the regularities in this space. And we try to use these uncovered regularities as our models of visual possibilities. So we encode these regularities, uh, especially these days in deep neural networks. So these are graphs of computations um, and then we search within these, uh, these computational graphs for regularities and we try to encode those regularities in this graph. So that means that searching in the space of images becomes searching for configurations of this graph that are compatible with the information we already have about the images we're seeking to model. So to do this, we define what we call objective functions. So this is, you can think of this as a mathematical description of a goal. And what we do is we seek to minimize that. So we seek to find the best configuration, which corresponds to the best approach, the optimal solution for our goal. So we can think of this minimization process as sort of wandering through a landscape, which we often call a, lo a lost landscape in search of the lowest ground. And now I'd be happy to pass it on to Philip to discuss a little bit as well about his perspective. Thank you, Nola. Um, yeah, also thanks a lot um, from my side for having us today. Um, my name is Philip Schmidt. I am a German artist and my work often deals with um, different aspects of computation um, as a topic. And within that I've made physical installations books, uh, websites, photography, uh, and sound. Um, in the last few years, I've been interested in AI research, particularly the kind of aesthetic and material dimensions of that research practice. Um, and since 2019, I am an artist in residence of sorts in a machine learning research group at New York University. Um, and my experience there and elsewhere has shown that researchers use lots of diagrams and metaphors um, like the lost landscapes we've just seen. Um, and I'm really interested in the visual conventions and their history, how researchers engage with the usually invisible aspects of their work um, for which I think uh, yeah, embodiment, imagination, and again, diagrams play a really important role. Um, and with Max, I've been working on a performance lecture touching on all these topics. And we're going to show you a clip from that work in progress. To learn is to be in the mountains at night, trying to find a way down 
to the village. To take a step in one direction. If it leads uphill, reverse. If it leads downhill, take another. To descend, to learn, step by step, until eventually the lights of the town become visible in the darkness. This is a picture from my mother's workshop. She's a stonemason and the work has marked her hands, showing, I think, the strength that sustained her working a man's job. In this regard, a cathedral workshop and computer science are two not unlike sacred places. We have a stone plaque on our porch that my mother made during her training. Translated from German, it reads, hands give shape to what only the mind can see. Mind and body have historically been studied as separate entities, leading to the belief that thinking and action are separate domains. In contemporary AI follows along, it has disembodied intelligence, has rendered it invisible. Yet metaphors to think about it reaffirm the body. It was our feet that led us down the mountain of learning. Okay, so um, now that we're all introduced, um, I, I would like to seed the conversation by going back to um, that picture on that last slide, Nyla, that you showed, uh, that lost landscape, because there was an interesting tag on the top right. I don't know if anyone else noticed it. It said one billion dimensions. And um, I'm curious, and I'm sure many others are exactly what that means if that's even meaningful and, and how to grapple with it. Yeah, thanks for the for the question. Um, so just to give my perspective, uh, I'd be curious to hear Philip's as well. Um, when so I would I would uh, one way you can think of it, this is not maybe the maybe the the most uh, completely accurate analogy, but I think it's a useful one in that you know, when I was referring to the image, um, thinking of an image as, you know, full of possibilities, right? So you have an image, uh, like a digital photo that we all know, that has many pixels, and those pixels can have um, every value of that pixel can change, right, in, in many different ways. Um, and we definitely have images with billions of pixels. So I, I think one thing, one way we could think about, like, one billion parameters is one uh, one billion pixels that can be sort of like modified in different ways. So that's kind of one way to think about it, at least to get a handle on it and what we think about these parameters maybe potentially corresponding to. Now in practice, um, when we talk about deep neural networks, they don't correspond, uh, you know, there's not necessarily a correspondence to the, what we would call like the input signal, right? So when I say signal, I'm referring to any sort of like, so something like an image or something like um, sound that we hear. Um, so, or text that we read, basically some sort of like, in, some sort of signal that gives us information or that we perceive. Um, and so very often there's, uh, you know, there's the image or some sort of input signal and you have um, these parameters, which are, what we do with these parameters is that we sort of try to find the, the setting or the right sort of configuration for these parameters in order to encode meaning or to extract meaning from input signals. And so in the same way that input signals are very sort of can be very rich, very complex and very high dimensional, there needs to be some sort of reflection of that in how we try to model or these, um, these signals using uh, billion parameter networks. Philip, what is um, what is your reaction to um, to a space that vast? You mentioned that um, people want to use their hands sometimes to think. How how might one use hands in a billion dimensions? Um, yeah, good question. Um, but first, where we one other thing I would add is that a lot of times when I talk to people about this about dimensions, um, people think this is like 
something fundamental to our world, like space time or how quantum physics has like um, opened the, idea, the possibility that there's different dimensions than the ones we can perceive. Um, and as far as I understand, this is not at all related to the dimensionality we're talking about here, like Naila said. Um, so that's, I think, is a good distinction. Um, and now to hands. Um, well, I, I, I guess I can start. Um, let's see how long winded this is going to get. Um, but I first came across this concept of high dimensionality um, when I started working um, or using uh, machine learning techniques for uh, my projects. And I thought this was really interesting that you have such a vast range of possibilities of continuums, especially in, in like a world where we're so obsessed with binaries and categories. Um, and I thought this was really fascinating. And I also think I noticed that I started getting a kind of intuitive understanding of this stuff. And maybe I'm just, a, um, this is maybe just how I think that, but I kind of um, started to imagine these things, these like bubbles flying around me. Um, and yeah, it seems like, and this is what I've noticed that this um, kind of imagination also plays a role for a lot of um, other people, not just me. And that um, researchers also often have quite intuitive understandings of these spaces and engaging with them using their hands and bodies as well. Um, so sort of like, an, yes, an embodied or intuitive access, but then um, that is really rarely talked about um, because it seems that doesn't, maybe it doesn't go with objectivity as much as we would like to, I don't really know. But um, yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> Naila, do you, do you feel like you, you know, when you define uh, uh, one of these so-called lost landscapes in the context of a problem that you're working on, do you, do you feel like you intuit in, in that space or how do you, how do you move around it? How do you reason uh, about it so that you can reach your goal? Yeah. So, um, so I kind of, think of them in maybe two different ways. So on one hand, there's sort of the, what I call the objective function, right? So this is uh, something that's also, uh, you know, and practically speaking, they're often what are called loss functions in the sense that the idea, you can think of it as um, representing some notion of regret in decision-making. So very often the, the, you know, the models that we try to solve, they're trying to solve uh, some decision-making problem. And then we want to sort of like minimize the, the decisions we made that were wrong. That's one way we think about it. In which case an objective function kind of becomes what we call a loss or sort of like regret minimization um, function. And in these senses very often, so I start off thinking of, uh, you know, what do I want to minimize, right? So what sort of decision process making decision process you're making? And that can be something as, um, you know, to put like a very classical computer vision example, assigning like some sort of label to an image to say, okay, this image, image contains um, a cat, for example. And so let's say you want to sort of minimize the amount of times that you misidentify a cat, then you want to sort of like formulate that mathematically into what we will call a loss function. And then once we have that, what the landscape becomes, it becomes the space of configurations of your model and this model can be vast, right? It can be like a billion, billion parameter model. And you're wondering this landscape, trying to find where is the location in this landscape that will minimize my loss function, right? So this is sort of like the connection between like the loss function and the landscape. So the la landscape is a landscape of high, so areas with high regret, areas where you're making a ton of mistakes, um, and then areas, and then you sort of have the valleys, right? So what Philip says is sort of like the lights leading you home, right? So we're trying to head toward these lights. And these lights basically are the regions where you're going to minimize your regrets. So you're going to minimize your loss. Um, and so they're sort of like, they're related in this sense. So the landscape is a landscape of objectives of loss, and you try to minimize that. I reply yes <laughs> and um i have a question for you so in my understanding 
the like the 3D or the 2D picture that we just that just came through a one-dimensional internet line, um, but it depicts a 3D landscape. Um, but then the landscape isn't even that right. It's high-dimensional as well because there are many more directions things could um, we could wander towards. So right. Right. Yeah. So the landscape that I showed, which was, is, you know, it's a landscape from uh, from a very interesting project, which uh, which I think Emily already linked to in the chat um, at lostlandscape.com. So this is, you know, one of many types of visualizations that aim to try to get a visual sense of what these landscapes can look like. Um, but as you said, they're they're two D landscapes, right? So they're very familiar to us because we we walk, you know, it's very sort of intuitive, and this is why we use them. But they're nothing like the landscapes that we that we're actually working with. So because we have we're working with uh, models that are millions and billions of parameters big, um, we're wandering through a landscape that is billion of a billion dimensions, right? Millions and billions of dimensions, and so. I personally am just incapable of visualizing that at all. So that's completely visually non-intuitive to me. Um, and then also, as you mentioned, also in some of your work, Philip, uh, it's not something that we can extrapolate and it's not something from our intuition because the way that, the way that distances work and uh, you know, probability works in low dimensional dimensions, the dimensions that we're familiar with, they don't translate right to super high dimensions. So we can't even sort of try to get an we can't get an intuition by extrapolation. We need to think completely differently. There's a, um, there's a question in the chat from Jack Mastow that, that touches directly on, on your work, Nyla. So I'm, I'm going to uh, repeat the question for everyone in case you hadn't seen it. Um, and, and maybe we can then um, transition a little bit into a conversation about what you're, what you're thinking about right now. Uh, the question from Jack is, an issue in deep learning is understanding the representations and features discovered. How can art assist their interpretation in forms that humans can understand? Philip, you want to tackle this first? <laughs> um... Yeah, if I understand this correctly, this may be referring to, um, or at least I'm associating with it with um, different visualization techniques um, that uh, a lot of, like there has been a lot of research in how you visualize features inside models um, to understand which um, signals, for example, in images are picked up on. Um, so, um, yeah, obviously, um, this is a, a, a worthwhile pursuit. Um, I guess my reply from my personal perspective is um, to use art um, to think about the image itself, not necessarily what's in it. So for example, I think the, the loss um, landscape example is interesting because as as far as I know, it's a it's a really recent project by a researcher who did this um, visualization. Um, but I think it's really interesting formally. It's like this, there's a YouTube video on that website that has kind of this um, epic electronic tune and um, the aesthetic generally is kind of one of the like sci-fi Tron legacy things. <laughs> um, and it's like, we have, we can move these mountains around like God and there's their pink um, and I think this is just uh, interesting, an interesting association, of course, with a lot of the metaphors that AI has been associated with recently. Um, the other example of also kind of a lost landscape that was in my little clip was from the 50s, um, from a paper by Oliver Selfridge, when that obviously was like this top-down topology view, more like an old atlas, maybe. And obviously, it's also related to the technical possibilities of the time. Um, and so I think long story short, what I'm trying to say is um, art can help <laughs> um, if we want to put in what it can do on it. Art can help to think through what the representations do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think that, 
you know, there's a lot of, I, I, it's a completely different skill sets and way of thinking and expertise to understand how to represent information visually in ways that are intuitive. And so, as you said, Philip, you know, there's a ton of work about understanding, trying to extract interpretable, um, let's say, descriptions of of what you know what deep models are representing and what they're predicting, and and sort of like the range of things they predict under which circumstances and with respect to what types of input. But thinking of intuitive ways to visualize that or to maybe think even about other modalities besides just sort of like visually. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting work that's potentially done there. And I think, you know, me as an engineer, like I spend most of my time going to the same tools again and again to try to try to visualize and get some intuition about certain, um, you know, like certain outcomes basically and to sort of probe the, the inner workings basically of models. Um, and I'm sure that there's a lot of work that artists can do to think of like maybe a different modality, maybe multimodal visualization, like, inter like let's say representations of, of data. So I don't know this space super well, but I think it's something that, you know, where they can be sort of rich collaborations. Um, Nyla, one, one thing that we've talked about uh, in the past is, is the extent to which we understand or don't uh, how these models function. We know that they work really well, we get results, um, but then when we open up the hood, things become uh, mysterious and, and you work, uh, but part of your work is, is on trying to understand that better. Um, could, you, could you walk us through a little bit sort of what, what the central problem is uh, as you see it, sort of the central stumbling block towards sort of understanding better, interpreting um, what it is that these models are doing and how? Sure. Um, I'd first like to say that <laughs> I think that our models, you know, the models that we have these days, by and large, um, work very well in the conditions if we match their operation to the exact conditions under which they were trained, right? So they're very good at what we call supervised problems. So problems where they have a lot of supervision from let's say adults right so we can say like machine learners who are sort of giving them many examples of here's what to do here you got it wrong here you got it right here you got it wrong again here you got it right and then by feeding this millions of times getting them to be good at a very specific thing um and there are many things tasks that we can train them to be pretty good at if they're seeing if they're tackling that same task um in the wild right that being said, once we stray away from that, if we put you know these these models in um, in a slightly different environment, then they can perform like catastrophically, right? So to give an example of this, um, if we train a model to let's say to sort of like understand you know extract semantic meaning from visual content, let's say to you know to understand what's in an image. And let's imagine all the images they've seen so far were in black and white. If we start to give them color images, they're just gonna fail catastrophically, right? And this is something that uh, you know, humans would not do you know, for many reasons, but the fact being that's something that might seem somewhat trivial to us, um, you know, it's a completely new environment for, for these models. So that's sort of just like a caveat on that sense. Um, in terms of how do we understand models, um, you know, I, I would refer to sort of like some of the work that Philip was mentioning before that's really tends to involve sort of probing models. You can almost think of it as, this is sort of like gonna be a very high level analogy and Carl, you can tell me I'm totally wrong. Um, but I think of it sometimes as when you, you know, in neuroscience work, when very often if you want to sort of probe some aspect of like the brain and some sort of uh, species, you might just put probes into some of the neurons and to try to see, okay, can I extract the signal from that neuron? And that might give me some sense of, you know, what's been happening or at least whether like a specific neuron is responding to a specific stimulus or a specific part of a stimulus. So very often a lot of work in neural networks take some high level inspiration from that, from simply saying, I have this model and to once again, make like a very loose analogy, right? Like these models are very inspired by neurons in the brain, right? Hence the name deep neural networks. And so another inspiration we get is to sort of probe certain neurons in these networks. And these neurons, each neuron is one of these billion parameters that we mentioned before, um, to try to understand, to try to get some sense of what triggers this neuron, what makes it spike basically, right? Within the input. 
Um, so that's one way. So this is something that we do. You could imagine that just as in neuroscience, it's it doesn't give you like a super full picture, right? But that's sort of one way that people do this. Um, another way that people do this is to try to visualize once again, um, certain patterns that come out of these networks. So for example, one thing you can do is try to visualize the parameters themselves, right? To try to get a sense of, um, you know, how have they been configured? basically. So what are the values we're placing on this? What's the configuration? And many, many times you can do this sort of just converting them into images and then getting some sort of sense from these images. But once again, when you have a billion parameters, that doesn't scale. Um, and uh, so I would, yeah, I mean, maybe to summarize, I would say that there are ways you can probe, uh, but it's still a very unsolved problem and it's still a very active area of research. Um, I don't think anybody has found a completely satisfying way to get the full picture on uh, on what many of these models learn. What what tool, if you could have any tool, what what would you what would you want to to answer that question? Hmm. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, you know, what comes to my mind, honestly, is that I'm not sure that there's a tool I could come up with. I think that because our minds are just limited to three dimensions and we struggle even with four, right? Um, even trying to come up with like an effective tool to visualize things better, it's, um, it's just coming up against, I think, a fundamental limit in terms of understanding you know, sort of like very high dimensional data. And then not just that, but understanding the questions to ask. So I think that before I can answer that, I think there's sort of like fundamental research questions that we would need to answer to even be able to understand where we're blind to. So I think this is a question that gets into kind of unknown unknowns basically about, yes, like what are the, it was like, a, you know, we're missing, I, we're lacking as a community, a lot of sort of theory about deep networks in general, about optimization, about better ways to find these configurations, for example. So I think that for me, one thing I would ask myself rather than trying to visualize it would be to try to understand a bit better how our, how does op optimization work? And if there's sort of like better ways that we can optimize and by optimize, I mean, how can we, are there better ways for us to find the right configurations for our problem. So another way to put that again is to say, can we find like better exploration strategies for our landscapes? Um, and so this is probably like the first thing that would come to my mind. So then maybe, yes, so maybe to, to actually answer your question, <laughs> um, if, if there was some way <laughs> to understand, to get a better sense of landscapes and not just that, but to be able to sort of find some way to map this very high dimensional landscape into low dimensional landscapes in ways that are meaningful, then that would be very useful. But the reason what I keep coming back to is the fact that just understanding this mapping is itself like a very difficult technical question, right? So it's hard to ask for that because asking for that sounds like asking for um, figuring out like an optimal object, like uh, configuration strategy, basically. So it's, a, it's like a theoretical question as well. Do you feel, uh, and this is a question for Nyla and, and also for Philip, because Philip, you're embedded in an AI research lab. Do you feel like we understand what we're doing right now? Or are we being just very empirical in the, in the sense that we're, there's something that's working and so we're just, we're, we keep doing it because it's useful to us versus do we, you know, do we know where we're heading? Do we understand what we're doing with these tools? Philip, I'll let you go first. Um, yeah, I don't want to speak for a discipline I'm only a guest in, <laughs> but um, I think in terms of representation, since Nyla also just mentioned, uh, it would be great to have better ways to think about landscapes. Um, I think the visual representations used are a little under theorized. Um, so. For example, there's an interesting paper I like by a media, I think media studies um, scholar named Fabian Offert about 
um, how any of these pictures produced to visualize features and so forth are also in themselves representations, right? This is not an actual picture of the thing because we cannot make one, maybe, I don't know. Um, and so, yeah, another, like there's a lot of theory and media studies um, about how we understand these things. I think that is something would be good to, to that would be helpful to think more about. And maybe one other way of putting it, um, there's kind of different theories. I mean, there's a lot of theory about diagrams, of course, and one tidbit of that is, um, what is a diagram? Is it like uh, ordering all these things into one picture, all these bits of information that you have, and then the diagram is kind of um, the visual representation of this? Um, versus another view that is that diagrams aren't like fixed after the fact, but the diagrams produce um, the the world going forward. Um, and that is maybe a little, sounds maybe a little esoteric, but in the sense that if we on, can only think of landscapes for learning, that will influence how moving forward we can think about learning. And so, um, yeah, I wonder what is what are different ways of going about this. Again, like all in this limited subset of visual representations. <laughs> yeah, so there's a good my take on it. I definitely think we know what we're doing in the sense that we we know that, you know, we have a lot of strong theoretical groundings for, you know, many of the algorithms that we use, most of the algorithms that we use um, and that are most successful. What, uh, what, you know, and there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of understanding, okay, we understand this specific algorithm extremely well, we understand its properties and how it works, and we have um, good justifications for using it, but we know it's not optimal. Uh, and that's where a lot of theoretical work still needs to be done, which is exciting, right? This is, you know, this is what, this is why it's an exciting place to work in as a researcher, um, because we know that we can find better, or at least we hope to find better algorithms. Um, we assume that better algorithms exist uh, because we know that other intel you know, intelligent machines actually learn much better than, than what we've come up with so far, right? Um, as in human beings. So the idea is that, you know, how can we do better, right? Um, and this is where a lot of work needs to be done. So I definitely think we know what we're doing. Um, I think we just understand that there are a lot of unknown unknowns. There's a lot of territory that we haven't covered yet. And, uh, you know, and this is what the work of, of many artificial intelligence researchers um, are about. If, if you had to guess, I realize there's no way to actually answer this question. Um, is are the advances required um, sort of improvements over the current state of the art, or do you expect um, the field to undergo the same kind of transition that it underwent over the last decade uh, with the arrival of, you know, for example, deep convolutional nets? That's a very hard question. Um, I, you know, to be honest. When you know, when I think of the field today, I, I think there's a there's an understanding, and I would say a fair bit of consensus around the fact that what has been extremely successful up to now, um, which is what I mentioned, sort of supervised learning, where you know, we're training some artificial intelligence model uh, with a lot of human uh, um, supervision, and we understand that this just doesn't scale. Not only does it not scale, but it's extremely hard to represent the richness of any problem, of any sort of decision-making process by exhaustively going through all the potential examples that you can come up with, even if we could do that. So it's just not something that scales, um, even for very narrow targeted problems, right? So even this, the, the simple problem of giving, you know, introducing an image and asking uh, an art, like a, a model, a, a deep learning model to enumerate all of the all of the objects within that image. Um, so you might say this is an image of an indoor scene of somebody's house and there's a couch and there's a table and there's some chairs, etc. That's something that models can do uh, fairly well, but they're still, you know, it's still not perfect. And there's still ex many corner cases that the model is not going to do well with, right? So for example, if there's, um, you might ask me why this would happen, maybe it will never happen, but if there's an elephant in a room, right, of an indoor house, it's just the model is just very unlikely to recognize an elephant as being there because it has just never seen that example before. And you know, humans can do that very easily, right? Like a five-year-old a child, once they know what an elephant is, they can say, oh wow, there's an elephant in the room. That's so surprising. Whereas uh, 
you know, the models that we train would be like, it's just gonna hallucinate something that makes more sense. It's gonna say like, I don't know, that's a big cupboard or it's something, but it can't be an elephant because why would an elephant ever be there? I've never seen that before. So this concept of what we call generalization of saying that I can take things, I have a general knowledge of the world, of how things work. I've had supervision. I have some things that are not supervised. I have things I learned from quote unquote common sense. And you know, that's a whole other discussion about where common sense comes from. Um, and then humans can put all these things together and then understand novel scenarios. And this is what we are just completely incapable of training models to do right now. Uh, we've taken some baby steps there, but there's just a huge gulf between where we are now and where what we, what we consider to be intelligent agents can do. And so for me, it's um, because this is, because the way we currently tackle problems is to supervise models. And because it doesn't scale, it's hard for me personally to see how sort of with improvements and what we're doing now, we're gonna get there. Um, but there's been a lot of exciting recent work on trying to go beyond that. Um, I think it's still somewhat in the same vein though. So I would, if I had to bet, I would probably bet on there being some sort of fundamental shift that's needed in order to, in order to take us there. I'm personally very excited in, in trying to understand better the interplay between supervised learning, which definitely happens with human beings, with human beings as well, and certainly for artificial uh, intelligence, and then also understanding what is quote unquote innate or hardwired. I think there's like a very interesting discussion to happen about what can, what can be learned and what is something that's sort of hardwired through, or let's say you can consider it learned through like a very long process of evolution, if you want to think of it that way. Um, which is what, you know, how a lot of machine learners think, right? So a lot of machine learners have these evolutionary algorithms or other ways of thinking that, sure, we can think of our model as, of, 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 as uh, undergoing some sort of evolution, but it's something that we're sort of speeding through, you know, through artificially, but it doesn't come close to kind of the level of not just evolution, but the level of variation, like all the mutations, like what is really, what really happens in evolution is something very hard to capture. And for me, I think that's going to be, it's something at least that I find very exciting, like this area. And there's a quite a lot of exciting work happening there. Is that really the solution? I, I wouldn't bet on it, but I think it's a very exciting one. Let's, um, let's touch on one of the sort of most high profile successes of, of the field in the last couple of years, the generation of algorithms that can compose text that seems intelligible to us. In fact, some, in some cases, even sort of interesting and well-written. Um, I'm curious about both of your perspectives from an engineer's point of view and from an artist's point of view. Uh, what, what do you make of, 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 these, of these models that have been very recently released, uh, GPT-3 being uh, the most recent and, and in some way successful one of them? Um, so, yeah, I guess um, some uh, bits of my um, new piece that we saw an excerpt from are also generated like that. <laughs> <laughs> so as I was writing the text, I just threw in a sentence once in a while, see what came up. Maybe um, if it let me tune your idea, I kind of picked up on. So I think all of this is um, extremely interesting for me because it's very, um, very stimulative for for the reason that it's not, I think, grounded in, well, the type, the way I would think. Um, so I really appreciate these text generators, but also yeah, generative networks for images and stuff for that, um, for that regard. And I, yeah, I guess on a different level, it's an interesting technology, but also a dangerous one, not for being like um, becoming sentient or something. But I think I recently read that um, one of the now biggest sources for fake generated personas um, for online misinformation um, come from one of these uh, image face generators, um, actually from a website that an artist made. Um, and so, yeah, that is, I guess, with all of these things, the crux that um, how will it be used? Um, probably, possibly by someone in some nefarious way, like with anything. Um, and yeah, that's a difficulty. 
Yeah, for my take on it is that I think that, you know, th these bottles, they're become extremely good at digesting vast, really, truly vast quantities of information and extracting signals from that. So understanding, because what these models are doing fundamentally is they're saying, if you give me a phrase, I'm going to output for you, what's like the most probable thing that would follow an input phrase, right? So if you give me this phrase, I'm going to tell you what's the next probable word or what's the next most likely word, et cetera. I'm just going to go in this way. So in some sense, they're able to capture, you know, to a really amazing degree, um, the variation and the variability of, and the sort of like distribution, if you want to say, of existing text. And that's really, truly um, impressive. What, um, what what I would find like truly exciting in the future is being able to come up with sort of like novel novel text, so novel speech or novel text, novel language, um, which are interesting combinations of that you can sort of extrapolate or think this would make sense based on things that I've seen, right? So human beings every day, um, you know, come up with sort of like novel com combinations of things, come up with sort of novel takes on words and language. And this is what I think it's really cool and creative about language, the fact that we can use it in very cool novel ways. And of course, there are many artists who, who spend a lot of time doing that. I think, I, you know, I don't think that the models we have today can do that. And we wouldn't, shouldn't expect them to, because that's not what they've been trained to do. They've been trained exactly to do what we described, as in to come up with probable phrases. And so fundamentally, that's what they're doing. They're coming up with basically trying to imitate uh, human speech, right? Which is which is what they're supposed to, and they're doing it extremely well. What I would find very interesting is coming up with, you know, having quote unquote like their own voice in some sense, like being able to come up with sort of novel um, ways to of, of expression using language. So, if we were to imagine a continuum between uh, the mechanical, the kinetic statues that Descartes saw in the gardens of Versailles that were sort of lifelike, and on the other hand, an actual biological organism moving around, where, where, would, where would you sort of place the, the, the production of, of speech by, by, by these kinds of algorithms? Are they, I, guess, I guess my question is, are they mimicking or are they speaking? So there's a very interesting recent work. Um, I believe the title is uh, On the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots. So this is a very recent work and I would encourage you all to read it. And as you would imagine from the name, it's it's more to us the former, right? So I don't think there's any sense in which these models uh, have any sort of understanding, right, uh, of the semantics, but rather they're much closer to parroting for sure than speaking. So the idea is saying, you know, something that sort of has there's there's a sense in which it's not exactly that, right? Because a parrot is not going to finish your sentence necessarily, right? Um, you know, maybe they can, I don't know. <laughs> but that's something that is, is different. Um, so they are, it's basically, I would think of these models as a like condensing um, speech patterns. So, and once you're able to condense the speech pattern, you know, which sounds kind of like a crazy thing, right? But being able to represent all the variability of what has been already said, being able to say that this sounds like something that was already said, and I'm going to sort of spit out something that seems like it conforms to that. So I wouldn't say it's like completely parroting, but it's certainly in no way I would say speech. Another sort of large question for, for both of you, um, very curious about your separate perspectives on this. Um, our, our culture seems to treat uh, artificial intelligence, at least in its latest iteration, um, as it does most, you know, potentially revolutionary technologies, a sort of mixture of uh, outsized hope and uh, perhaps outsized, perhaps not outsized fear. Um, and I'm curious uh, what both of you would think about what a future AI might look like from an engineer's perspective uh, and from the perspective of someone who's interested in the cultural impact of AIs, for example, I, you know, Philip, you've done a sort of um, taxonomy, a natural history of how we represent visually our, our future overlords, as it were. Um, 
where 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 do you see um, where do you see our thinking about these thinking machines going? Um, so I don't have like a grand theory of AI, <laughs> um, but I think yeah, what you're touching on something important is that the concepts are incredibly murky um and like no one even talks about the same thing when we talk about intelligence or learning um often by uh like practitioners the definitions are very narrow but um if someone out from like the general public reads this in the news it sounds very um wide and yeah i think that the issue is also with um i guess this is um goes towards the like the sci-fi imaginary is that, that it's really distracting from maybe some of the problems that are currently existing in this field and i mean in a lot of like computational how computation affects the world not, not just in machine learning um so i think there's already so many like systems deployed that use machine learning in some way that are harming some people um, where, and we shouldn't be worried about the future overlords coming for us. Um, yeah, that would be my reply. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, I've, we've touched already on the fact that there's a huge gulf between, you know, what quote unquote artificial agents are capable of right now and what, for example, humans are capable of in terms of learning, in terms of being able to extrapolate from their previous experience to novel uh, environments. And this is something that I think um, is going to hold back any, for, any form of truly intelligent um, agents for artificial agents for, for some time. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I would never, um, I would never like dismiss out of hand the possibility that we're going to see some very incredible breakthrough in the next few years. Um, but it would be like quite a breakthrough. So it's not something I think any of us should bet on happening in, uh, you know, given the current state of the field. Um, that being said, I definitely agree with Philip that what I am more concerned about is, uh, let's say, premature uses of artificial intelligence. And not just that, but of misunderstandings of what agents are capable of, um, which leads them to be misused, leads them to be uh, trusted more than they ought to be. Um, because very often, I think there's a sense in which folks tend to think that artificial agents are somehow, because there's not a human involved, they're more objective somehow, they're more quote unquote scientific, and therefore we should sort of trust the science, which means trust these agents. Um, whereas in reality, as I mentioned, most agents are trained to mimic. So when you have, uh, when you have an agent that's making decisions about uh, giving somebody a loan or making a decision about, uh, you know, whether someone uh, should go to a specific university, for example, all of these decisions, you know, using modern technology, they'll be made simply by saying, what have humans done in the past? I'm gonna do that thing. <laughs> and so we can imagine how that's just simply going to replicate at massive scale, um, good decisions and bad decisions that humans make, right? So these are not agents making decisions for themselves. These are agents trying to stand in as airsats humans. And do we want to deploy these systems like this? And not just that, but deploy them while thinking that they're perfected versions of humans, as opposed to understanding that these are just replicated humans making sort of the same mistakes humans would make. If we, you know, they're both bad, right? But not understanding that is, is much worse. So these, these are the things that concern me per personally. That's, that's sobering. Um, Let's, um, let's open up the conversation to our participants on the call. Um, before we do that, um, or to kick it off, I, I should say our program partner uh, called 1014, A Space for Ideas, has sponsored a question for both of our panelists. Um, and the question is, to what extent should the general public be capable of, quote, thinking like a scientist? Um, and what good would it do? Uh, you want to go first, Philip? Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, one association that came up for me is how over the past year, we've all been with the um, COVID-19 pandemic, we've all been trained to read 
um, these uh, diagram, uh, these like curves of infection rates and uh, um, the well, kind of the all the the knowledge that comes with with that, and trying to live by that um, to do the right thing to be safe. Um, I think in the context of machine learning research, for me, um, I would say it's maybe not important necessarily to think like a scientist, but to not be afraid of the matter. Um, I think the topic is of, um, like Nyla just said, is very of, like, of, it's very important um, for everyone because this stuff is so widely deployed. Um, and so we shouldn't be afraid to engage with it, to think like, oh, I don't know math or something. And um, I'm an expert in not understanding what I see every day, um, which is at NYU. <laughs> um, and so my personal take on this has just been to look, um, especially on these visual, visual representations that the researchers are making um, through the lens of not what does it tell them, but what does it tell about them? Um, like, what, like I already kind of hinted at, what is the the maybe the which conceptions of intelligence, for example, are implicit in a diagram, or um, what does the style of rendition mean for how people think about um, this and that? And yeah, I can do that with understand by understanding relatively little, <laughs> and I think it's been somewhat insightful. I hope. I don't yeah, I um, I would say it is important to understand. I think what's important to understand is what you know what science means and what the scientific process is and how do folks come about with what they consider to be new knowledge, right? And what sets apart something folks are fairly confident about as opposed to something that's a hypothesis. What's the difference between those things? Understanding that these things are usually a spectrum rather than sort of just like you know a binary. This is known. This is not known. So I think that's extremely important for folks to understand. And I think that, you know, Philip brings a good point, brings up a good point in that I hope that, you know, all of our collective experience with COVID has made pe people understand how iterative the process of science is and how it's not just a straight path to knowledge from like zero knowledge to 100%, but that you take steps forward, you take steps back, and that it's all understandable that we, you know, like the scientific process is all about having certain hypotheses, testing them, getting some new information, not necessarily the eureka moment where you understand everything, but at least you get a bit more information that allows you to make, maybe refine a little bit your hypotheses and then try again. And then it's just a constant process of getting, taking a few steps closer to the truth, sometimes going on along the wrong path, having to back up and go again. So I think it's, it's important to understand that science is a process and it's not, uh, you know, it's not in, it, at a, on a long scale, I think it's very robust, but at small time scales, it, you know, there's a lot of noise and that this is to be expected. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not something to be afraid of, but it's just good to understand that science is something that there's a level, there's a concept of maturity <laughs> when we talk about science and scientific knowledge. And I think that that's something that it's um, super important for everybody to understand. I definitely second that as, as a scientist, I have to say. Exactly. Struck, also, Philip, by your comment that you're an expert on not understanding what I see every day, because I think that's actually a very good definition of a scientist. <laughs> um, so questions are coming in quickly on three different screens on my computer. So I apologize if I don't get to all of them uh, before the sun goes down. Um, the first one I have is for Nyla. The question is, if you're working on enabling AI to identify an elephant in a room, do you expect text producing algorithms to be able to use novel language the same way? So for me, that's um, it would depend on the on the type of uh, technology we're focused on, right? So. To this, you know, there's, let's say there are two kind of very broad, rough ways we can think of it. So one thing would be to, to think about what we might call like um, goal-directed outcomes. So understanding what it is we want to achieve with a model. And we might have like a very specific focused goal. And that goal might be 
creating novel language. Maybe just for the simple reason, you might like to create some kind of um, virtual agent that has their own personality. And so you might think for me to give this, to breathe life into this, you know, we'd like this person to be able to, this person, this agent to be able to, sorry, you know, this is why people get into problems because we anthropomorphize too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's our fault. Um, so yes, yeah, so you might want to say, okay, we love this, this agent, this, this artificial agent to have some novelty to their speech so they don't sound like a parrot, right? So that might be one reason you might want to do it. In that case, that would be great. On the other hand, if you really did want uh, an agent that could understand speech solely for the purpose of understanding it, it might not it might not be that important. Although now that I think about it, I think it's um it's it's always important, in fact, I would say, to and I, so I would say the holy grail for an agent that would understand language would be for an agent to be able to at least understand. Um, novel speech, so sort of some sort of language, some sort of text they've never seen before, simply for the reasons I mentioned before, right? So being able to generalize. So in the same way that a human could hear someone who speaks, you know, speaks like maybe English, like I do, um, but it's not from where I am. And so maybe they have a different phraseology, they maybe they express things in a certain way. And, you know, very often you're hearing someone speak in a language you know, but maybe they're they're just not from where you are. You don't you're not familiar with their their sort of like um, uh, the way they express different things. But you can intuit, right? You can say, oh, I think I know this person's referring to. I can understand why they would have referred to something this way. And being able to kind of understand relatively similar language, but in a, in a somewhat different context. And that I think is something that we would always want like an intelligent agent to be able to understand. But we're not there yet. Interesting. Um, the next question I have is, is also directed at Nyla, but I think actually it would be interesting uh, to pose it to both you and to Philip, because uh, it has to do with the, the process of creating. Um, the question is um, about errors. Do you think it will ever be possible to create AIs which are not deterministic, but which are capable of identifying an error as something creative, um, to make an, a discovery by error by mistake? Or is it impossible by design? Maybe not. You go first. You can take it. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know, as usual. Um, I was just, my first uh, inclination was to take the picture of the long, lost landscape and then invert it. <laughs> so instead <laughs> of looking for the valley, you look for the hill and see where you go. Um, my other answer would be, uh, I'm actually frustrated with these, for example, image generating neural nets getting better and better and the re resolution getting higher and higher. I kind of liked them five years ago when they were really blurry um, because it gives a lot of um, space for me and my own mind to um, kind of fill in the details. And so, yeah, I don't know, maybe the way to that is not like like optimizing for something, but yeah, an error, I guess, or lower lower details. I don't know. Yeah, the, yeah. My thoughts on this are that I definitely think it's possible to, you know, I think the question is asking basically, is it possible to sort of come to new knowledge um, by error? or maybe even by happenstance. So, um, you know, there's a lot of artificial intelligence work and let's say machine learning work that's that's very, that takes inspiration, not necessarily from finding things by error, but finding things almost randomly, right? There's a concept of, there's a concept of exploration and curiosity driven sort of like uh, learning where, which, which sort of basically acknowledges the fact that a lot of learning can happen by simply, you know, experience, right? But not necessarily by going towards something, um, you know, for in a specific, in a goal directed way, by, you know, having this knowledge happen somewhat, somewhat um, randomly. So I think that kind of gets to it. Could someone, um, you know, could an agent sort of combine knowledge, new knowledge, um, by error? Um, yeah, I think it depends on sort of what the notion of error would be. Like if that would be, if by error you mean, 
maybe sort of like exploring a direction they're sort of quote unquote not supposed to and then sort of saying oh wait a minute this is actually like a great local minima in my landscape I didn't expect to be here um, I shouldn't be here but I'm here and, and this is great I yeah that's um, that's an interesting question and um, I think it's yeah it's hard for me to project the notion of uh, of error of coming into this space by error and then sort of um, uh, happening to come across new knowledge this way but definitely I think if we if we ask the question somewhat differently in terms of, is it possible to kind of randomly come across knowledge? I think definitely. Uh, we next have a question from Kay. Machine learning generates uh, from practice rather than from theory. Is there a danger to not having a theoretic framework? Yeah, so maybe, so just to be clear, um, yeah, maybe I've given the impression that there's not theory. There's definitely theory. There's a lot of theory. Um, where I would say sort of um, practice comes into it is that I would say a lot of machine learning research, you know, there's a lot of machine learning research that's simply based on computation and information theory. And, you know, it's extremely theoretically rigorous from first principles. Um, I would say that most perhaps, or let's say certainly like a lot of machine learning research has a lot of theoretical understanding um, and explanation for algorithms but where it's more practiced in that you know as i go back to there's no sense in which these you know the algorithms that we use often are optimal and this is where practice comes into play so very often machine learners are guided by intuition and they take inspiration from many places so from neuroscience research from observing other intelligent agents and saying, oh, you know, I saw my child and they learned this thing this way. Um, I wonder if a human being can, I, I wonder if an agent can learn this way. Like literally, you know, this is this is how some inspiration happens, right? And so that's not that, it's, it's, it's sort of not theoretical. That's just a sense of just getting intuitions, trying to find a way to encode this observation that you've seen and say, is there a way I can replicate something like, like this in an algorithm? And you might be able to do that in an algorithm. And you might be able to understand that algorithm extremely well, right? And have a very strong theoretical understanding of how that algorithm would behave under certain circumstances. But that's, but you don't have a sense to which this algorithm is, is optimal. You have you know, many possibilities of algorithms to choose. And in terms of searching the space of learning algorithms, that I would say is definitely, um, there's no, no one has come up with sort of like a theoretically grounded way to search this space of possible algorithms. And so, that I would say is um, is practice more than, or let's say intuition more than theory. Is there a danger? Um, I my you know my gut feeling is that I think it's good that we know this, <laughs> and I think once this is kept in mind and once this is understood, I don't think it's necessarily a danger. Um, I think you know if the moment comes when you know we sort of forget that you know a lot of the learning that we've we've the ways in which we teach these models um you know it's not the it's in no way optimal then i think that might be dangerous but i i don't see that happening maybe to add um Naya knows much more about this than i do but in the history of computer vision research that was uh it was the norm for a long time to um, write certain like a theoretical framework or certain ways um, images are interpreted so to find a face you will look for this color contrast in that area and another one nearby that maybe would be representing eyes and so forth so there the attempts there were attempts to um, build for example computer vision on um, theories of how vision would work um, except that, that didn't work <laughs> and now we are in this um, phase where everyone everything is being learned um and what did i just want to add to this oh yeah and oh yeah, the other thought i had was um and for this carl knows much more than i <laughs> but um it's as far as i know we know so very little about um how we think and all a lot of the theories about that aren't entirely resolved either so what framework would we even be referring to? Um, for example, what would be a theoretical framework of how vision works um, or how we understand vision if we don't really even know for ourselves how that would work? I'm not endorsing either approach. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a very interesting point. And it's, 
it's a little scary actually as a biologist who records from neurons on a daily basis to understand how very rudimentary forms of intelligence unfold because Nyla and, and her colleagues, uh, AI researchers, have access to every state, every single neuron, every single synapse in the system over time as it learns. And they're still struggling to understand exactly how it works. Whereas we have such an impoverished view on the system, we're seeing such a small part of it and it's noisy and imprecise. And so it, it actually gives me a lot of pause when, when speaking <laughs> with people like Nyla. Um, all right, I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions before, before we wrap it up. Um, uh, this is uh, from Jack Mostow, again, actually, uh, earlier, who, who posed that question earlier. Um, there are two parts, or actually it's two questions. Um, the first uh, is uh, people are understandably and justifiably reluctant to believe the decision or uh, solution by a black box deep network that's too complex to understand. How can art explain specific decisions by judiciously simplifying the computation underlying? I um, would say that's not the job of art to do, <laughs> um, to, to work for towards that. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I guess this is really the crux of this is that the complexity inside a deep neural network is extremely high and naturally we expect to have um, understandable decisions um, that we can make sure we agree with how the, a decision was made um, but also by insisting on that we have to simplify which um, is inevitably, inevitably simplifying what's actually happening so it's kind of paradoxical um and yeah one interesting uh example that a colleague of mine um is working on is on it was it's a study about how judges um make uh decisions which is um usually referred to as like being on the press legal precedent uh, and so forth but um this study showed if i put this together correctly that um, this is actually, as one would naturally expect, uh, influenced by a range of experiences and often the legal justifications are made after the fact. Um, so I don't want to um, endorse robot judges, uh, the contrary, um, but yeah, it's interesting what, I guess, like what expectations we have um, and how, if they can be met um, and what are the consequences of this? Um, do we just go forward or do we not um yeah i think that's one of the biggest questions in this field or how it impacts the world yeah philip i, I couldn't agree with you more uh, on the, your first point which is i think key that simplifying decisions as you say it simplified those decisions right and so one of the one of the you know the values that deep networks bring is that they're able to um, you know, find very complex patterns, right, by sifting through a lot of data and finding, you know, a lot of different variables, right? So we, in these models, we have 1 billion parameters. If you thought of these 1 billion parameters being each an explainable parameter, saying like this parameter is, um, if I like to understand, uh, you know, what the weather is going to be tomorrow, I have like a, an agent that will predict the weather system. And I said, this parameter is the weather in this country, this country, this country, this country, this country, this country. And um, the reason why I think the weather tomorrow is going to be, um, you know, 29 degrees and sunny is because, and you can think to yourself to try to, I can't even describe to you a good example of what that would even look like, because it's just many different factors that are coming in. And asking to simplify that is is simply not going to do it justice necessarily, at least potentially, right? So this is, you know, um, as Philip said, I think we have to ask ourselves: Are we asking too much, right? So there is there are limitations that we have in our, in in terms of um, being able to make sense of a lot of disparate information, and I think that I don't think there's you know an easy way to to go past that, right? So um, so that's yeah, that that's yeah, sort of my take on it as well. Okay, one, one last question. This is uh, the second one from, from Jack. And, and actually, I'm going to build on it because it touches on a curiosity of mine. Um, you know, we talked about um, these networks that are able to classify images with, with high performance. Uh, we talked about 
a GPT-3 that can mimic, simulate uh, language to an uncanny degree. Um, and uh, so Jack, Jack is curious about the extent to which one art can illuminate how to integrate uh, vision and language um, and combine visual and verbal knowledge to understand the environment. And, and I guess the, uh, another question that's related to that, that that I've had in my mind is, is, is maybe that what we're missing, Nyla? Like, would, is, is the fact that a lot of these models have been produced to solve a problem within a specific um, area, be it visual or, or um, grammatical, um, would an integration of sort of different modalities, as it were, um, get us closer to something like a, an artificial, uh, sort of a more general intelligence uh, that, that, that's you know, less prone to the kinds of errors you mentioned? Yeah, so I think there's a lot to that. I think that's a great question. It's something that, um, you know, there's a rich field of research um, that, you know, that I'm not a part of in, you know, in different fields, like in neuroscience and learning theory and, and other areas, and, 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 and especially in robotics, right? About, and this comes up, you know, it's very salient in robotics as well, in terms of to what extent can intelligence be uh, disassociated from um, embodiments of intelligence? So. There's a sense in which, you know, human beings, we don't learn simply with our eyes. We learn with our eyes, we learn by touch, we learn by hearing, um, we learn by speaking, we learn by, you know, acting. Uh, we learn by fe sense, feeling wind on our, on our skin. So there's a sense in which it's not clear whether we can separate all these things and whether the sum of them, you know, equal exactly like their parts, right? Or maybe there's something more than that. And maybe somehow intelligence emerges out of all of this. So I think that, that's for me a very promising area being able to put together all of these senses and then to use them to understand if this is um how can we create you know the types of intelligence that we are familiar with now i wouldn't you know i wouldn't go as far as to say that's necessarily always the case but i certainly think that in a, in so much as we're trying to gain inspiration from biological systems um we have to consider the fact that biological systems are embodied uh, all the ones that we're familiar with and that's not something that we can treat as, as, as separate. So we can't necessarily just have a computer being fed images and expected to understand scenes in the same way as a human who is moving through that environment. Do you, Nyla, or do you feel, feel like, like art can, can, can bring something to the table uh, that can uh, help, help resolve this problem? You, I'll let you go first, Philip. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I only have associations and the, what I was thinking about earlier, um, when you spoke about the language can only be generated from like past or like past probabilities. Um, well, let's see if this is going to be entirely off topic. Um, I don't know yet. <laughs> um, I was thinking um, because my native language is German and German is um, supposedly very good at, at putting words together that make an entirely new meaning that will immediately be universally understood by all Germans. Um, and there's a whole range of words that came up during this last um, pandemic year. Um, but yeah, I guess it, this is not poetry, but in a way, this is something I would like to see in these systems, um, or I would be impressed to see that, um, yes, you can put things together by statistical association, but how can how does that create meaning? And I mean, poetry can make you cry, maybe, um, but can a GPT text do that? I'm not really sure, um, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know, this is a non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, I continue to think that, you know, and be, because what I've, as I mentioned before, a lot of work that 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 we as machine learning researchers, and I think as scientists in general, a lot of work that we do comes from from intuition. Um, you know, intuition comes come and sort of uh, not just intuition, but um, you know, just some inspiration can come from very strange, you know, very, you know, different places. Um, and so I think that seeing, you know, like seeing visual phenomena from a different point of view can sort of highlight like different ways of seeing things you might not have seen. So it would not surprise me necessarily to imagine seeing 
um, you know, an artist like Philip, like look at the outcome, the outputs of uh, of a model and say, oh, you know, I notice this pattern in what's in what they're in, in certain, in how certain in, in inputs map to outputs, for example, that maybe I wouldn't have seen, right? And that, and so I think that just having sort of like a different eye for a lot of, um, for content, especially folks who are really immersed in creating content every day, or whether it's text or images or, and, and things like that, can look at the world in novel ways and can look at these outputs in novel ways and then maybe um, help, you know, help folks who, who are used to seeing it maybe from a slightly different perspective to understand, ah, you know, this is like, I didn't catch that, for example, in this, um, in, in the work that I've been seeing. So that's something that for me, I think holds some promise. All right, actually one more question that got in right under the line. Um, this is from uh, Agnieszka Kearns, who's a conceptual artist um, and who has some experience working with the kinds of tools that, that we've been describing today. Her question is, um, don't you think that the model and the way that these tools work both in machine version and GPT-3 can lead to homogenization of outputs? She says, I tried working both with GPT-3 and with machine vision, and I feel that the results produced by many creators with these tools, artists and writers, are often formally similar. I mean, I would um, agree. <laughs> and yeah, this comes back to what how Nana explained how everything is drawn on the same kind of corpus of things past. Um, I think good art just goes beyond that. Um, and in a way, there's only so many things you could do with paint, I guess. Um, but and then there's so many things you can do with paint. And yeah, I think that is the challenge. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree more. I definitely think that there's, there's, you know, if you think of, let's say, like the space of probabilities for any sort of, let's say, generation process or prediction process, you can think of it as a, you know, once again, as a landscape, but this time, like maybe not a landscape of loss functions, but of a loss function, but a landscape of likelihood, a, life, a landscape of probabilities or like likely things to happen. And so, you know, these are what these models are creating, right? They're create, they're looking in, for example, a space of images or a space of like maybe strengths of text, like phrases and saying, where are the spaces where, you know, these are more, this is, there's, there's more likelihood to have seen something like this and spaces where there are less, right? And simply by that fact, um, and once again, by and this is something that is not a fault of networks, it's a fault of our inability to express um, more of what we want, right? So we're asking these models to represent this and this is what they do. And so at the end of the day, they are not, um, they're biased away from low probability um, signals. And that means by definition that when you're outputting, um, the output that they that they would come up with is not going to represent things that are novel, right? Sort of by design, basically. So, um, so I think that once again, and this goes back, you know, to I think a theme of generalization and being able to um, react to and generate novel experiences. That this is something that is remains like a holy grail for artificial intelligence uh, researchers: how to go beyond um, mimicry and go to actual. Um, making new meaning of, of, um, of the world. All right, well, Nyla and Philip, it's been a real privilege for me uh, and indeed for, for everyone on the call to hear your thoughts on, uh, on the state of the art in artificial intelligence. I wish I could invite everyone to the bar across the street, uh, only we're all on different streets and it's the middle of the pandemic. Um, so all that we can do for now uh, is to follow up on, on the work of Philip and Nyla uh, on, on the various links that were posted uh, in the chat, um, papers, um, Philip's website, various resources, um, and hope that one day we can all meet in person um, instead of this contrived uh, Zoom, Zoom format. Uh, but in any event, thank you so much for, for your time and your thoughts today. Uh, thank you to Kay and to her team for uh, organizing this event. Um, and thank you to all of you who came for, uh, for your participation. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl.